Psilocin is a psychedelic that has been used for millennia. It is found in many fungal species alongside psilocybin, which turns into psilocin in the body. Mushrooms that synthesize the drugs are still picked in nature, but a lot of the ones on the market are cultivated. Among psilocin's positive effects are mood lift, euphoria, sedation, closed and open eye visuals, greater introspection, and greater creativity. Its negative effects can include fear, anxiety, confusion, nausea, GI discomfort, headache, and dizziness. It is generally more sedating than other psychedelics. Like with other psychedelics, the experience is heavily dependent on personal and environmental factors. A good mindset and environment may reduce the chance of a negative experience, but they don't guarantee tea a positive experience. Orally, the drug lasts for 4 to 7 hours and begins working in 20 to 60 minutes. The onset can be shortened to some extent by chewing the mushrooms and then holding them in your mouth prior to swallowing. Psilocybin is a prodrug for psilocin. This means it is metabolized into psilocin before it becomes active. Because psilocybin is carrying around some unnecessary molecular weight, psilocin is a little more potent. Both drugs are substituted tryptamines, which exert their effects primarily through serotonin receptors. 5-HT2A is a key target for psilocin, though 5-HT1A and 5-HT2C are also agonized. Unlike some psychedelics, there is no direct agonist activity at dopamine D2 receptors, but there may be downstream indirect effects on dopamine via its serotonin activity. Orally, a light dose is 0.25 to 1 gram, a common dose is 1 to 3 grams, and a strong dose is 3 to 5 grams or more. Dosing is complicated by variations in potency among different types of mushrooms and even individual batches. One of the most popular species, Psilocybe cubensis, contains around 0.6% psilocybin and 0.6% psilocin. Depending on the individual mushroom, the amount of those drugs could be half or twice as much. The ratio of psilocybin to psilocin also differs, as does the concentration of the drugs in different parts of the mushroom, such as the cap versus the stem. Potential evidence of psilocybin mushroom use dates back as far as 5000 BC. No final judgment can be made, but paintings in northern Algeria may be suggestive of psilocybin use. Stone carvings in the Americas dating back to between 1000 and 500 BC are also suggestive of mushroom use. More concrete evidence of psilocybin mushroom use appeared during the time of the Aztecs. Administration by the native population was reported by Europeans during the 1500s. The Aztecs commonly referred to the mushrooms as teonotocotl, or sacred mushroom. Here's how one Spanish priest and ethnographer described the indigenous practice in the mid-1500s. The first thing to be eaten at the feast were small black mushrooms that they called notocotl and bring on drunkenness, hallucinations, and even lechery. They ate these before the dawn with honey, and when they began to feel the effects, they began to dance, some sang, and others wept. When the drunkenness of the mushrooms had passed, they spoke with one another of the visions they had seen. As the Europeans gained power in the region, they opposed the use of various plant drugs, including psilocybin mushrooms. The practice was driven out of the public sphere. During the early 1900s, Americans and Europeans wanted to learn more about the use of psychoactive mushrooms in the Americas. Because there was relatively little information to go on, some people even believed the mushrooms were entirely fictional. In the 1930s, a group featuring Robert Whitelawner, Gene Johnson, Ermgard Whitelawner Johnson, and others reported the use of psilocybin mushrooms near the Mexican region of Oaxaca. Samples from Oaxaca were eventually received at Harvard by Richard Evans Schultes, one of the most important ethnobotanists of recent centuries. Schultes became publicly supportive of the view that psilocybin mushrooms had been used for centuries and were still being used in Mexico. In 1938, he traveled to Mexico and collected samples of psilocybe cubensis and psilocybe carolescens. It is believed P. carolescens was a historically important mushroom in the region. More research was done by Robert Gordon Wasson, an amateur mycologist, and Valentina Pavlovna, his wife, in the 1950s. During that time, they observed and participated in mushroom ceremonies. Along with French botanist Roger Heim, Wasson published a popular article about the mushrooms in Life magazine in 1957, sparking the curiosity of many Americans. Roger Heim also looped Sandoz's Albert Hoffman into the situation by requesting his assistance in learning about the active chemical constituents 
constituents of psilocybe mushrooms. Hoffman's work in the area resulted in him becoming the first person to isolate and synthesize psilocybin and psilocin. Sandoz marketed psilocybin as endocybin during the 1960s for psychotherapeutic and experimental reasons. Many people became aware of and used the mushrooms in the 1950s and 1960s. Since then, psilocybin's psychological effects have been researched and it remains one of the most widely used psychedelics. Psilocin and psilocybin are controlled in most countries, including the U.S., where they are Schedule I federally. The laws are somewhat complicated in the U.S. when it comes to mushrooms. They aren't specifically scheduled, but growing, selling, or possessing them is illegal. An exception to this may be in Florida when dealing with wild, non-dried mushrooms, but I think it's safer to always treat them as controlled. Spores are generally not controlled because they don't contain any illegal drugs. There's a legally operating market for them them in the U.S., though there are controls in California, Georgia, and Idaho. The physical concerns with psilocin are very low at common doses, and even overdoses are low risk. Most of the fatalities on record are the result of accidents that occurred while on the drug. Some users have jumped out of windows, and others have been killed by the cold. These accidents cannot be blamed on psilocin, but they are a good reminder of the strong psychological effects psilocin can have. You do need to keep these effects in mind when considering the drug's safety. There are a few pharmacological deaths on record, but they represent very rare results responses. One person died after presenting with convulsions and another died from cardiac arrest. In the latter case, the user had gone through a heart transplant 10 years prior. They didn't show any physical limitations, but it's still not a normal situation. Nonetheless, cardiovascular issues can appear. Negative acute psychological responses have been widely reported. Panic attacks, derealization, and temporary psychosis can be caused by psilocin. They usually go away within hours and rarely last into the following days or weeks. Lasting issues are very rare and might be more common in people who have a mental illness or a family history of mental illness. Tolerance occurs after the first use and it will be gone in around a week. It should go without saying that picking wild mushrooms can be very dangerous. There are case reports of people using the wrong fungi and ending up with kidney failure and death. If you have any questions about psilocin, feel free to leave them in the comment section. Support on Patreon is greatly appreciated, so if you'd like to contribute, you can head to patreon.com slash the drug classroom. You can also contribute through YouTube, PayPal, or Bitcoin using the addresses and links in the description. You can connect with me on Twitter at Seth A. Fitzgerald and via email at seth at the drug classroom.com. More information and links to references can be found on the TDC website using the link below.